In this film, we're going to look at the electrification of transport, why we need to do it, what will be the challenges for industry and for science, and where the future might go from here. So around a third of our personal transport is for social and leisure, about a quarter of it is for shopping and family errands, about a quarter of it is for business, and the remainder is for education. That's typically taking kids to school and back. So much as we'd like to reduce the amount of emissions of CO2 and pollutants, the challenge that we have is that transport and economic growth are very strongly linked together. But unfortunately, this growth in transport comes at a cost. We can start by simply traveling less. For some of those journeys, we do have a choice about whether we travel or not, particularly things like social and leisure. But when you start to look at education and business, you don't really have a great deal of flexibility around that. The second thing that we can do is to look to use the best mode of transport. Buses and trains, for instance, can be very good as long as they've got high levels of ridership. An empty bus, of course, is much worse than a car with one person in it when it comes to CO2 emissions. Next, we can look to manage the way in which our transport network works. Engines produce more emissions as they accelerate and decelerate, and cars use more energy if they brake and accelerate often. Keep traffic flows smooth, then emissions are much lower. Congestion, of course, is a major problem. One of the things that we can do to control this is by moving to more automated or autonomous vehicles in the future. There, we can get many more vehicles into the same space on the road where we're not reliant on human drivers. Unfortunately, we're still at least a decade away from having that around us on a regular basis. We must improve the technologies that we put into the vehicles we use. We make them lighter and we need to make them have lower drag so that they use much less energy. Next, we must improve the powertrains of our vehicles. We need to move away from diesel and gasoline engines, which produce emissions and are not terribly efficient, to those which are electrified so that we can use the reversible qualities of an electric motor and a battery to make the vehicle use less energy. And then we can look to reduce the carbon in the fuel that we use. Biofuels, for instance, typically use waste materials or crops, or we can move to forms of energy like wind power or nuclear. So what's wrong with the cars that we drive today? So in theory, the chemical reaction which goes on inside our engine is very simple and completes with some relatively clean outputs. The reality of it, though, is a bit more complicated. We take a long chain hydrocarbon, that's something like petrol or diesel. That molecule is built up of a long chain of carbons with hydrogen molecules all the way around the outside of them. We then react that long chain hydrocarbon with oxygen. The long chain hydrocarbon breaks up and as it reacts with the oxygen, the carbon and the oxygen makes CO2, that's carbon dioxide, and the hydrogen and the oxygen goes on to make water in the form of steam. Unfortunately, in reality, that equation does not work exactly as we'd like. The oxygen that we take into our equation comes from air, and alongside the oxygen in air, we have nitrogen. In addition, that reaction between the carbon and the oxygen does not go to completion every time. So sometimes, instead of having CO2, we might have carbon monoxide, or we might have hydrocarbons in the form of soot or particles coming out from the equation. The nitrogen in the air can then also react with the oxygen. And that's what produces oxides of nitrogen, or what's commonly called NOx, which contribute to poor air quality, smog, and respiratory diseases. So the next problem that we have with our car engine is that it's much bigger than you might think it needs to be. It only actually takes 15 kilowatts or 20 horsepower to drive a typical family car at constant speed at about 70 miles an hour on the motorway. And yet you'll see that the minimum engine size you can buy in most cars is about 80 or 90 horsepower. And the reason for that is quite simple. We don't just drive cars at constant speed. We want the ability, when we put our foot to the floor, to be able to accelerate safely out of a junction. And that means that we have to have a large engine in order to give that performance. The reality, of course, is that we spend most of our time in that car driving at relatively low speed with gentle throttle positions. What you can see from this graph is that the contour lines, which show fuel efficiency, demonstrate that the most efficient point to run the engine is at quite high load, which means with your throttle position relatively open, and at relatively low speed. That condition is a really unusual one to drive at. You might get to it if you put a caravan on the back of your car and drove up a steep hill for a long period of time. Most of the time we operate down here at light throttle positions and low speeds. And unfortunately you can see that that's in the least efficient parts of the engine's operating map. Next, we can use the fact that we've got an electrical network on board the vehicle to take some of the accessories that were previously driven by the engine and have them driven from that electrical network. At the moment, things like fans and water pumps and air conditioning systems are driven by the engine. And because the engine speed varies as we drive, we have to size the system so that it works perfectly well, whether the engines are idle or whether it's at very high speed. 
that tends to mean that either we're wasting energy when the engine's running at high speed, or we're having a very large pump or fan or device so it still works efficiently at idle. If we take that system off the engine and instead drive it electrically, we can make it smaller and we can drive it only when and to the extent that it's needed. It also means, of course, that we can turn the engine off when we're sitting at traffic lights or when we're stationary in traffic. What we're doing is gradually making the engine smaller and then using an increasing size of electric motor and battery to fill in the gap. Here, the battery is a 12 volt battery it needs to deliver about three kilowatts and to store about a kilowatt hour of energy so that if the engine is stopped, say the vehicle's broken down, there's enough energy in the battery to keep the hazard lights on for several hours and keep the major systems still running. As you make the engine smaller, we move to something called a mild hybrid. Typically here, we'll have an electric motor of about 10 to 15 kilowatts alongside our engine. Because we've gone up to about 10 or 15 kilowatts, we need to increase the voltage of our system in order to keep the current under control. So typically to get to about 15 kilowatts on our vehicle, we need to increase the operating voltage to about 48 volts. As we step beyond that into our full hybrid, now we take the engine down to about 60 kilowatts and we have about 40 kilowatts of electrical power available. That means we need to increase the voltage again, usually to somewhere between about 100 and 300 volts. As we move beyond that, we can start to replace the liquid hydrocarbon fuel on the vehicle with electricity. The first step of that is our plug-in hybrid. And here we have a battery on board the vehicle that's typically enough to do about 20 miles of range. And that's great for doing the daily commute, fully electric, particularly in city centre areas. But for that long weekend journey, you still have the internal combustion engine, which will do the 300 miles or more that you'd expect from an internal combustion engine car. And beyond that, we move through our range extended electric vehicle and up to our electric vehicle, where we do away with the combustion engine completely, and now all of the traction is provided by the electric motor, around 100 kilowatts. Now at this level of power, we have to increase the voltage of the battery to somewhere between 300 and 800 volts in order to keep the current down and keep the losses under control. Our motor now is about the same size as the engine that replaced it. So part of the reason that we don't jump from the top of this diagram straight to the bottom is that as you take each step in the electrification journey, the cost of the system, the cost of the components goes up. What you'll see is that you can make a conventional internal combustion engine for about 1,200 euros, including its exhaust system, including its engine management system. It's a remarkably cheap form of propulsion, and that's why we've used it for so long. But as you start to add electric motors and batteries and power electronics, and as those components get bigger and bigger, you can see that the cost of the system increases significantly to the point that our full electric vehicle, if it's a long range one, can be up to 10 times the cost of the conventional engine it replaces. The battery in particular is the defining component of the electric vehicle. It affects the cost and the price of the vehicle, the power, how much performance you can get from it. It affects the range of the vehicle, how far you can drive it. It even affects the life of the vehicle. And the really good news is that thanks to research over the last decade or so, this technology has become much cheaper and much more capable. To put that into numbers, if we'd been making this video in 2010, I'd have been talking about battery costs of the order of $1,000 a kilowatt hour, when today they're more like 150. So that's almost a tenfold reduction in price. And in the same period of time, the energy density of the battery has gone up by a factor of two. So that means that we can package about twice the amount of range into an electric vehicle now than we could have done in 2010. And in the future, it's not just the technology of the batteries and motors and power electronics that will get better. We'll also start to design our vehicles differently. The infrastructure for charging vehicles is still a little sparse. As that improves, you might logically expect the ability to stop at a service station and charge it very quickly, maybe in six or 10 minutes. At that point, we can make the battery in the vehicle smaller, lighter, and cheaper. As we start to be able to access transport in different ways, there'll be roles for small, light vehicles that are used for commuting and in city centres. So you'll see a number of concepts coming out already from manufacturers that look like this. But I think as that problem gets cracked, it will really open up opportunities for public transport as well as for short-distance personal transport.
In our next film, we'll talk in a bit more detail about the battery.